Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of This Week in the Lab. And as always I'll start you out with our weekly roundup of stuff. Uh, we got our typical paint from the Home Depot. Just one this week, 50 cents, always. Uh, this is pretty cool. This is a snap-on T-handle. It's a midget it's referred to. The old midget sets. Snap-on M3. It was made in 1936, and at first glance, this looks like a standard quarter-inch drive tool. It's actually a 9/32 drive, which was a common drive back then. And there's there's a little detent ball here that's supposed to capture this that's missing, and the detent ball that captures the socket is missing. And I have a couple options. I could leave this as is and hang it on the wall, which I'm not. I don't usually do with tools. Tools are meant to be used, I feel like, and so I like to use them. I could find some sockets that fit this. They're out there. They're a little pricey. Or I could actually mill, take, leave the side with the detent ball and mill the other three sides down and it would slightly offset it and I could use quarter inch drive sockets on that. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this. It would ruin the value if I did that but I'm still not sure because the value to me with most tools is are they a useful tool and because most of the time I'm going to keep the tool forever anyway and it's not really there for resale but that's still pretty cool 1936 snap on and it does have the date code stamped on it most all snap on stuff starting with 20, 1927 I believe had a date code stamped on it I believe you can find that online the picture of all the date codes so that's pretty cool. A uh, couple of cape chisels here. This one's a Stanley. This one has no markings on it that I found yet. I gotta clean these up. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with cape chisels, they're they're wider on the end and they narrow down. They're designed to cut keyways and grooves, and the the way they're shaped there, they won't bind up when you're cutting. So these are, I mean, they're these are dull. I'll have to sharpen them, but they're in pretty good shape. This one, however, don't ever let this happen to your chisel. This is a very dangerous condition. Uh, this stuff can get, when you hit it, can shatter off of there, break. It's just very dangerous to let the tops of your chisels punches mushroom like that. Always keep them ground. It's just, that's a bad habit right there, a real bad habit. I've uh, got this nice rigid number 2A pipe cutter. I don't have one one like this. This one has the one cutter and two wheels to keep it straight. I have a number 42A which is a four wheel cutter design for tight spaces when you can't make a complete circle you're cutting pipe. But this I, I paid five dollars for this. I think these are about hundred and fifty dollars new and this one's in great shape. So that'll be I'll take this to the shop actually. This will be great at the shop. We do a lot of cutting of pipe there. Uh, these are pretty nice. These are for leather work. And these help lay out your stitching pattern. I think you can actually get an embossing wheel to go on this one too. But these, these are different. This is a, a 7. This is a 5, which I think actually refers to how many stitches per inch. This one is a number eight. But here's the cool thing about this one. Take this end off. There's one volunteering. This one had a, a bunch of other wheels in it. There's a 10, a, a nine, a 12. Well, it's either a nine or a six. I'll have to measure it. Uh, this one's another number eight. I think that's all. But there's five wheels with this one. The only issue with this one is the little thumb screw. This was this has been well used. This little thumb screw that actually captures this. You can see how much it's worn, so I'm gonna have to machine out a new little thumb screw. I could probably buy one, but it'd be just as easy since we have stock laying around to machine out one and thread it for that. So that's a super nice tool. I love these old tools, wooden handles, and I do a lot of leather work. These will be a nice little addition to that kit. And the last thing we've got, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in depth, is this file. Now this is 
sometimes called a Vixen file, even though I think Vixen was actually just the, the company that made them. Uh, it's also called a Dreadnought file in some corners. But this one's a Nicholson brand. These are designed for rapid removal of material and they and removal of material that's soft, lead and aluminum, because these don't clog as much. And the way they're cut, this rounded cut, it's designed to remove in the center and push debris away and out. So they're really good for soft materials. Now this one, you have to watch old files when you get them. They can be messed up, dull, just junk. This one I could tell still had a little bit of sharpness to it and there was no chips. It's loaded up with some rust and junk but there's no chips, that I, no real visible chips I can see in the blades. So what we're going to do is we're going to clean this up and we're actually going to sharpen it. And I know what you're thinking, how you sharpen a file. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to go over to the whiteboard. I'm going to show you some pointers on that and how to sharpen a file. I learned how to do this from an old book from the 40s. And you can get you can get about three sharpenings out of a file before they're worn out completely. And it has to be a quality file. There's no point in sharpening a cheapo. But without further ado, I'll take you over to the whiteboard and we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, so we're talking about sharpening a file. And the first thing I want to mention about this is your files are eventually going to get dull from use, but don't hasten that process. And what I mean by that is, I see this, this is a common mistake. When you're filing something, never back that file up. Never drag it backwards across something because you're, you're rounding those teeth off. It's not designed to do that. File forward, pick it up, reset and file again. And this one should have, you should never use one without a handle, honestly. It's just dangerous. You can't get a good grip on it. Uh, the proper use for a file, now this is all coming, I was taught by a lot of older gentlemen and reading a lot of older books. Uh, you should have one hand on the handle and guide it with your other hand. That's the proper use of a file. And there are going to be some situations where you obviously can't do that, but that's the proper hand filing technique that I've always read, always been taught. But the key is just that I always go with, and I see people sawing away at stuff with a file. Just don't, don't do that. Don't back that file back up across material, and try not to file really hard metals, hardened steel. It's just they're not designed for that, unless you have some special file. But anyway, back to what we're talking about: sharpening these files after you clean them. And I hope you can see this good. This is a profile of the teeth they're about. Uh, excuse my crude drawings here, but this is what a file looks like new. You have this, this sharp cut on your teeth there. And of course it's going to work really good. So what happens when they get dull, especially if you start dragging them backwards across something, you round these teeth off. Just like this drawing here. They get rounded off. They lose their efficiency. The file becomes dull. And you need to get it back to something like this. Obviously that metal is gone at this point, so you're not going to get it back to perfect. So what you're hoping for is this third drawing. And as you can see, the teeth have been recut. They're not exactly like this, but they still have a cutting edge. And the way you do this is you take this file and you sandblast it away from the tang. This way. Sandblast it backwards. And what that does, it knocks off part of the teeth. It actually cuts away some of the metal. But because you're doing it backwards, the direction of the sandblast hitting it, it knocks the back of this tooth down more than the front. You know, bring this back to a sharp edge. Now you can do this two to three times with a good file. And this is coming straight out of a book written in the 40s uh, that I learned a lot from. It's one of my, my highest regarded books when I was learning how to machine. And this, this works. I've done it. I buy these old files all the time, and if, as long as they're not chipped up, I usually can get at least two, three sharpeners out of them. Most of the time, if I sharpen a file, I can use it for years before it needs again if you if you don't drag it backwards. Or, you know, sometimes you will hit something hard unexpectedly or testing a piece of metal and you'll dull your file a little bit. But this, that's how you sharpen it. You essentially just 
sandblast it in this direction and it's going to knock that rounded edge back off of those teeth and bring it back to where it'll cut again. So uh, uh, that's a little tip I hope you can use and talking a little more about something we found this week. So now we'll just go and see what we're doing in the lab in the shop this week. Alright, so this is about a 1949 Philco range that we're about to start working on. Uh, it's an electric range and this thing had some really strange drip bowls underneath the burners and I'm going to go back in the, we're at the shop, I'm going to go back in so you don't hear so much traffic noise. So, this is the drip bowl that goes under the, the element. It's aluminum. I would like for it to be steel, but these are aluminum. These are rare, I can't find any online, and we're missing one. So what I've done, and I didn't get this, the procedure on film, or it didn't get me making it on film, but I've made a new drip ball. I made this one out of steel. We're gonna paint these with a high temp paint anyway. This will be a real, a little more rigid. These aluminum ones tend to warp after they get a little hot. So I made this one out of steel and I didn't get footage of me making it but I'll go over and walk through what I did to make it. All right, the first thing I do is get a piece of sheet metal and this one actually was longer. It's what I made made this one out of. So I think I'll have enough to show you here. Yeah, barely. First thing I do is take this because we're not really doing anything with that outside diameter. And just mark it out. And what, uh, I cut it out with some aviation snips. <clears throat> cut this circle out. And that's step one. And I'll actually, I'm going to actually go ahead and cut this circle out so I can help demonstrate. Even though we're not going to make another one, I can show you a little better after I cut that out. Okay, so I've got my sheet metal cut out here. And if you'll notice, it's just slightly larger. I cut on the outside of the Sharpie mark. I use a Sharpie marker to mark that. And I cut on the outside of it because when we shrink this, start shrinking this down and bring it up, we're going to lose a little bit of this diameter. And that's the first thing I'm going to do, so I'm going to show you kind of what I'm going to do with that. Okay, that's the shrinker stretcher. I got this at Harbor Freight. And it's not a bad machine. It's worked great for me. Uh, there's a few tricks with this, and I might do a video on that later. Basically, you flip the jaws around when you shrink more. And I bought the stand that went with it. So we're just gonna we're gonna go around the edge, and I'm just gonna start shrinking around this edge, and that'll bring it start bringing this up a little bit. And once we do that, we'll start roughing this in over at the sandbag. And I apologize for not filming this as I went. I didn't think about filming when I was making this piece, and I should have, but. I think you'll get the idea. So we're, we're gonna walk over to the sandbag and I'll show you what I kind of started doing there. Okay, we're here at the sandbag and what we're gonna do, uh, we will we'll have already shrunk the edges down a little bit and started with a curve. What I like to use to get the initial shape, this is a hammer I made. Uh, it's made out of the top of a cylinder, like a oxygen cylinder. <clears throat> so this hammer is pretty heavy. It's got a pretty good uh, crown on it, and we can get a lot of shape quick with this. So we want to just start at the middle and pound this out, working kind of in a spiral out, and then back in the middle and working again. We want, to, we want to get this middle pretty low to get this shape. So I started with that, worked out, got the roughness in. <coughs> And then I switched to actually another hammer that I had made. This one, and I like this one a lot. This is made out of a baseball bat. But you've got two different crowns on it. And I switched from, from that to this crown, working out some of those walnuts. So walnuts is what we generally call them. 
Uh, they're big bulges you get from hammering with a rounded end. A lot of them. I worked some of those out and got a little more stretch with this. Now I switched to this end, worked a little more because it's a smaller end. And I went to this hammer, which is a professional made hammer, and worked it a little more with that and got the initial stretch. After that, get you turned around here. I came to the English wheel and I put a high, little higher crown than this end initially and I started wheeling this out, getting those walnuts out. Started smoothing it out. That's, you can see the, how it's a lot smoother now. There's no big bulges in it. I worked, that, worked all the walnuts out and I flipped down this rubber. This is a piece of inner tube that I put on here. And I flipped this and it goes around the wheel and that allows the bottom die to push up in a little bit and get more stretching action. So I could get more, more stretch than normal with the wheel into this piece. Once I did that, I switched to this die, which more matches the contour of this piece. And I just worked it with that until I kept working it. And because this is domed in all directions, I would work it and spin it. Every time I would roll, when I'd come to the center, I'd spin it, spin it, just slightly. And this worked it even to get that dome. Because you want to, when, you, when you're going through this, you want to look down and make sure that your dome is the same. And this, the English wheel is a real slow working machine. You, you don't get anything done fast on it, but it does a real good job. Once I get all that done, had the dome in, I had to work on the hole, and that's back to the bench, and I'll show you what we did with that. Okay, so to do this hole, I just imagine there's no hole in this one. What I did was I put, I just dropped it in, as simple as that. Got the edges all lined up. And took my Sharpie and just real carefully drew this out. In there, and that gave me where I need to cut. After that, took a step drill. I like these a lot. Drill the starter hole. My snips, rough cut it, and you can cut this out with snips. But I, these are nibblers. These are actually designed more for electronics industry. Cut out square holes and panels and whatnot. I actually got these at Radio Shack. A lot of companies make them. Um, but I like these a lot because they, they cut really clean. And it's a little bit of a stretch. This is 20 gauge for them to cut 20 gauge because they're not really designed for that. I think these are actually designed for about 24 gauge. But if you take it slow and easy, they work good if you oil this. And this is a, a little thinner than 20 gauge any, now anyway because you've stretched it. But with these, you can just nibble your way around and cut this hole, and it's pretty nice. I haven't even filed this one yet and, or cleaned it up, and there's no burrs, no sharp edges, and you tend to get that with aviation snips. So after I got the hole cut with these, with these nibblers, it's just flat. You know, it's two on this. I want to cover, make sure you understand that the hole you draw is not what you want to cut because that's the, the size of the finished hole. Once again, I went to the inside, left the Sharpie mark. You gotta have extra material because you're gonna flare it down. So this hole was quite a bit smaller before I flared it. Now to flare it, this one was pretty easy. You can use about anything to do this that will withstand you beating on a little bit. I went and got these two pieces of PVC. These are just PVC fittings. This one's angled on the inside, and it's just about perfect size. And this one's straight on the inside, and it fits on this almost perfect. So what I did was I took the angle one initially, set my piece on it, and I just eyeballed it and using another hammer that's homemade. <laughs> I made this. This is just two uh, grade 8 carriage bolts and weld it on and I made a place for the handle to go. I need to replace this handle. I made this when I was a little younger. I wasn't too good at getting handles in there, but it's still working. 
But anyway, this is two grade eight carriage bolts welded on. Uh, this one I left alone. This one I cut the head down smaller. They got a real high crown on them, and I like that. So back to this, I with this hammer, I put this down and I started working the working it down in slowly, going around, working it down in, working exactly down in on this this angled piece, and that let me work it all down and stretch it against this angle and once I got because these are essentially the same size in here once I got that angle I could transfer it to this and set it in and it would hold it centered while I worked I used this same hammer and worked it around against this flat edge and that gave me that nice flat edge there or close gave me real close after that I used the bigger side stood my piece up like this and worked it around to help flare it out a little more then back to this and working it on in there with that and after that all I got to do now is sand this out clean up these edges a little bit clean up these edges this one of course is a used one we're going to sandblast this and clean up any burrs and stuff because we're going to reuse these originals and then we're gonna uh, paint everything to match and it'll be fine for the customer. I did not, these aluminum ones have a rolled edge here for extra strength. And that's all it's for. And it's not designed in that to catch on anything or help hold. It's just for strength because these are so flimsy. And I did not do that on this because this is 20 gauge steel and it's plenty strong enough without it. But that's just, that's a drip pan for uh, 1949 Philco electric range. This is nylon. It smells like nylon anyway. It's an unidentified piece of plastic. But for what we're doing, which you will have to stay tuned to see what we're doing, I will give you a hint it does involve fidget spinners, but not in the conventional way. Make of that what you will. Alright, we're still working on this piranha plant, and this is going to be our linkage system underneath, I think. Uh, essentially we'll have a servo here we've we've had to order some high torque servos to get enough travel out of the plant coming out of the tube we're going to have to pivot a lever here and put the short end towards the servo so a little bit of movement here creates a lot of movement out here and that's the reason we needed extra torque so we've ordered some high torque one high torque servo for this this will be mounted underneath the box I did not get footage of building, but it's just a simple wood box. And this will sit up there like that. We're going to make the stem of the plant out of CPVC. It's, it's real close to the size we need, and we can get fittings and stuff to glue on this if we need to. And it's a common, common material, easy to work with. We can paint it. So we're doing that. This lever idea work, and this will will attach another servo here that'll run the jaws of the piranha plant when it raises. We're hoping that we can get enough pivot here to actually raise the plant from concealed to out with enough to get some leaves to pop out too. We got a plant from Hobby Lobby that we're actually having good leaves in. So, still in progress. We're down to the more of the engineering system. Kilo's got the code figured out with some sound effects and how to move the piranha plant up and down with the Arduino. I think, which Arduino are you using, Kilo? Uh, the Arduino Nano. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's pretty small. So this will most, mostly be hollow space. We'll have this lever system mounted probably as long, we're going to be as long as we can so we'll use this corner the servo will probably be over here in this corner with a pivot close to it where we can 
take advantage, this is three and a half inches here. Take advantage pretty much of the whole three and a half inches of travel there. Pretty close. We'll physics won't allow it to be a full probably, but that's gonna be it. Hopefully we get this together before the child's birthday party that we're preparing it for. So this is going to be the stem of the piranha plant. I believe we're going to use this. The inside of this is like 475 thousandths of an inch, which is almost the major diameter of a half inch bolt. So I'm going to, it's plastic. We need to thread a piece of plastic or a bolt with a hole in it or something in here to attach the tennis ball to the top it has to have a hole in it so some strings can pass through which will actually activate it i think i'm going to be able to capture enough thread for that to happen this is a half 13 tap and i think i'm going to be able to get just enough thread to you know to hold a tennis ball on that's real close to the diameter anyway 0.5 25 thousandths so about twelve and a half thousand on each side of thread depth. But I think that's gonna be plenty to hold a tennis ball on top, I hope. If not we'll we'll back up and try again. I'll lay that there on that lovely Chinese New Year thing that Driveway Primitive brought over here. Yeah, I think that's going to work. I, I think that's plenty of thread to hold a tennis ball in there. <laughs> 